Thank you very much. Um, how appropriate to uh, be here talking with you all about a lectureship that represents both asthma and um, disparities. Uh, they are clearly interwoven uh, and have the similar roots of poverty. And so I, I appreciate the opportunity to represent kind of the disparity side of that, um, of that conversation. So very excited today to talk to you about a few different things. Um, number one, why would physicians advocate? Why is that something that we should be thinking about? Local examples of advocacy, innovating together, how can you do this work with your local communities? Then moving on, we'll talk about how we advocate at the level of the state, uh, and then leveraging some innovation uh, to do national work. So looking forward to walking through that. So the first thing I want to do is introduce you to a community that uh, I care very much about. My clinical work has always been in general pediatrics in a federally qualified health center, an FQHC in East Palo Alto called Ravenswood Family Health Center. And it's an incredible community in East Palo Alto largely immigrant community. I uh, spend most of my days speaking Spanish and have just enjoyed getting to know the community very much. This is an aerial shot of uh, where I live and um, the East Palo Alto side is kind of on the left side of this huge highway, the 101. Anybody from the Bay Area? Maybe this looks a little, okay, looks a little familiar. So the big 101, which is our uh, large highway, Ravenswood and East Palo Alto are here on the left, and then if you take that overpass and take it all the way up, you end up at Stanford. So the divide is uh, kind of right there, East Palo Alto and Palo Alto. Uh, right there in the middle of the blue, that's the uh, Ikea store, the land of Ikea, my husband calls it. I've been forbidden to take him there on weekends. He totally refuses. Um, so what's kind of, when I had that picture up initially, what's the first thing that jumped out at people? Not a trick question. Yeah, all the trees. So there are more trees on the kind of Palo Alto side of the 101. And I think that's interesting. Why would that be? There's not more rain or it's not landfill on this side or something like that because the bay, the bay is uh, below. Um, so why, why is that? And I think it's emblematic of um, the fact that trees thrive on the side of 101 because policy decisions are made around resources and about supporting a green environment. And different decisions are made for financial reasons, for resource reasons, and other reasons on the other side of the 101. So trees and children tend to thrive on one side and it's rooted in policy. So let me give you a few statistics about it. California free and reduced lunch. And all of these uh, slides are set up the same way. The California statistic will be on the top, the East Palo Alto statistic will be on the bottom left, and the Palo Alto one on the right. Uh, some are school districts, some are city statistics. So, Free and reduced lunch, this is our best measure of poverty. Uh, this is the way we know what percent of kids live in poverty uh, because the schools every single year work very hard to identify every single kid who needs to get that lunch. And so in California, almost 60% of children qualify for free and reduced lunch. So that means 60% of our kids are living in or at poverty. In East Palo Alto, it's 93% in the Redwood City School District versus 8% in Palo Alto. So significant segregation. What about preterm birth? Overall in California, 9% compared to about 11% uh, in East Palo Alto and 7% if you don't live in poverty. So right from the start, we have disparities uh, out the gate. Obesity. Our overall obesity rate is 30%, which is uh, in poverty. You lose the story unless you de-aggregate that data. Um, when you Break it down for kids who live in poverty, it's closer to 44%. Uh, kids who don't live in poverty, it's closer to one in five. So I think this is such an important uh, lesson for residents and fellows is when you're given a statistic, think, does that need to be pulled apart? Uh, are, you, are you missing the story by aggregating the data? Um, because in my clinic, it's, it's half the kids. And this isn't overweight, this is obese. Uh, and so it's, it's a, a very different story depending on where you live. Third grade reading level, so we're going to switch a little bit to educational metrics. Third grade reading level is very important for educators because up until third grade, you're learning to read. After third grade, you're reading to learn, okay? So if you're not reading by third grade, you're going to really quickly be falling behind. Um, and so overall in California, and this just hurts, <laughs> only 45% of our kids are reading at grade level. Uh, in East Palo Alto, it's 22%, so only one in five are reading at grade level. 
And in Palo Alto, uh, a, a very well-resourced school district, 80%. So very different. California school personnel. So these are the people in the schools besides the teachers, the nurses, the reading specialists, the uh, techs, the uh, art teachers, et cetera. Uh, and these are the ratios. In California, we have um, about 236 kids to one student aide or, or these kind of other personnel. In Ravenswood, in East Palo Alto, it's almost 400 kids to one. And in Palo Alto, it's closer to uh, 140 to one. So I just told you, where do we need the reading specialists? We need the mini Palo Alto. Where do they exist? On the other side. Policy decisions. These are not accidents. Okay, these policy decisions drive where children thrive. We could make different decisions. California high school rate, dropout rate, the cycle continues. And this is what I saw, I saw over and over in my East Palo Alto clinic. And um, the, the longer I have worked there and gotten to know the families and seen this, I've drawn more and more on my public health education. As much as I do my, my MD, I use my MPH a lot in partnership. Uh, with the schools and doing different things, and that's some of what I want to talk to you about. But I think this is why we need to start to consider advocacy as a role for the physician. I think this is put best um, by Dr. Wise, who's one of my colleagues. Pediatricians are the ultimate witnesses to failed social policy. And I love that. And I think if we think about what rolls in our door every day, um, you know, whether it's food insecurity or school failure or uh, violence, it's all, it has its roots in policy. And, and as physicians, ER docs, pediatricians, I think we inherit failed social policy uh, over and over again. How we think about that and how we think about our role in that is uh, what I'm excited to talk with you about. So I want to talk to you about how we do this uh, work locally. How do you kind of get your head around <laughs> these you know, big issues when you're, when you're really busy in clinic? And I think that the key to that is, is through partnership. We need to start working uh, in partnership with each other. So I want to kind of zoom you in here a little bit. The, the, that's a, obviously a picture of California. I'm your northern neighbor. Um, zooming in, you can see the Bay Area. Uh, here's a different shot, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose. So this part um, kind of on the left there is called the peninsula. Um, and uh, the mid-peninsula uh, is an area, so the whole peninsula, it's a very urban dense area, huge amounts of green space have been protected and so all the urban uh, development is, is there on the side of the bay. And the mid-peninsula we would consider right here kind of spans from Mountain View up uh, into Redwood City. That is where Stanford is uh, and East Palo Alto. So if we look at that community, um, in this community, there's the uh, Stanford Hospital. So the Stanford Nursery delivers all of the Medi-Cal deliveries. Uh, so we uh, are the site of delivery and very, very busy OB service uh, for this entire region from South San Francisco all the way down. Um, so all of our babies are, are born right there. And then they go to uh, basically five different clinics. Uh, we have our academic medical center clinic. That's our teaching clinic. That's our continuity clinic for our residents. Um, and then the federally qualified health center in East Palo Alto. We have a couple, uh, San Mateo County is our county, San Mateo County clinic, so county-based system. Uh, and then a community clinic down here in Mountain View. So these are the five clinics that take care of all of the low-income kids in the Mid-Peninsula. So 100% of the kids who are low income go to these five places. And um, it's 50% of the kids. So half of the kids born and who live here are low income, and they go to these five, five places. So a few years ago, um, I was really noticing that we have this really one population of kids, and they, they would go back and forth, right? They come, they have a bad day in my clinic, they go to your clinic, they bounce around. Um, so it's one population, one community, um, but we don't work together. We have completely different bosses, right? I'm at Stanford in our, in our teaching clinic, and so I've got you know, my whole group, and, and we're, we're doing our stuff, and then the county reports to the county, and they, they have their bosses, and then we have another FQHC in a community clinic. And so I thought, well, this is kind of crazy. Um, we all take care of this one population. Why don't we see about coming together? And so I reached out and I sent an email and I said, hi, you don't know me. Maybe we all know each other's names on charts or whatever, but why don't we get together and talk about what our issues are? And 
I sent it out to 12 people and um, hoped six would come. 12 out of 12 came. It was a great conversation. And we understood each other. We just got each other. And we said, what, what makes us crazy? What, 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 is the, what are the biggest pressing problems for our kids? And could and should we start working together? And at the end of the really energetic day, I said, or half a day, I said, so there's a lot of ways we can go going forward. We could you know, do a joint email four times a year and just update each other, everything to going to meeting weekly. We've been meeting every other Thursday for the last five years. And people, um, we start at um, 8.15 and people just push their clinics back to start their clinics late on, on Thursday so that we can all meet um, because we can move things forward faster together and really practice a, a, a different level of pediatrics. So these are absolutely inspiring, fabulous colleagues uh, that uh, work across the system uh, to, to take care of really great kids. So it really is about practicing population pediatrics. At the beginning, we said, what is the most frustrating thing we deal with? And we said, our kids are not ready for kindergarten. We could really tell that in that five-year-old well child check, the kids were not ready. Bright kids, bilingual kids, super smart. You could see it in their bright eyes. But they didn't know their numbers. They couldn't write their names. And so we started to say, why is that? What's going on? And so we got busy, and we put little libraries in every clinic. We prescribed library cards. We are doing a texting intervention to help the parents increase literacy. Uh, we have school coaches now uh, in our clinics. We're assessing our kids. And our goal is to have 80% of our kids, just like in the Palo Alto District, 80% of our five-year-olds ready to go to kindergarten when kindergarten starts. Uh, and we think that because they come to us all the time, we see them all, all the time. If we're all doing this together, then we can get there. The next thing, uh, we were still coming out of the recession. Our kids were still hungry. Uh, food insecurity was a big deal. And so we spent about a year standardizing the FDA evidence-based questions, making sure we were all asking the same question, building deep partnerships with our food bank, getting the food bank in our clinics, making sure we were ref referring everyone to CalFresh, our food stamp program. So just saying all of our low-income families are going to come through our clinics. We're going to make sure they all leave screened and connected to resources to reduce food insecurity in our region. And finally, mental health. And we stop every January to say, OK, what's our biggest issue? And uh, last year, it was, it was mental health. And it came, one of my colleagues said, um, I uh, was talking to a mom, and she's just so afraid because of immigration and what's happening in our community. And she said, feel my heart. And, and my colleague said, she took my hand and put it on her heart, and it was just pounding. And she said, it's always like that now. And I'm just so worried about immigration. And so we got, we got busy on that. We knew ACEs were coming. Um, and it could really a combination of, of these new ACE screenings and the stress in our community around immigration. We're so frustrated that we don't have enough mental health providers. And I know that's not unique to the Bay Area. Um, so ACEs are coming. Nadine Burke Harris, uh, I know you guys, I think, have heard from her recently. Um, amazing. Um, she's blazing this new trail, ACEs. And then the question is, what do you do if they're positive? How do you screen for these adverse childhood experiences? And when you learn that families have had them, what do you do? Um, and so she's our California's first Surgeon General getting sworn in there by Gavin Newsom. Um, and so this has started. And so we saw this coming. And again, we were worried about our families and felt like, OK, there aren't enough mental health providers. The Calvary's not coming. That is not going to change. We all needed to kind of move past the denial and the complaining about that and say, OK, what are some other solutions? So Reshma, one of my colleagues, said, you know, I heard about this program, REACH. And it's founded by these uh, child psychiatrists. And they come and they train pediatricians to do basic mental health services. So they train you how to screen and diagnose and treat anxiety, depression, and complex ADHD. And so if we could do the bread and butter, the basic stuff early with our families, maybe we would have less complicated mental health issues to refer to our very overextended uh, psychiatric um, colleagues. So uh, we raised the money. And there we are getting trained uh, in May, uh, May of 2019. This is what it looked like in the room. It was three very intense days of thick, thick books of hundreds of pages of material. I felt like I was back in med school. I was like, woo. Um, but very interactive. It was, it was great. And so at the end of, of, of the three-day weekend, um, 35 new mental health providers in the community. 
And uh, I have to say this completely changed, changed my practice. It, I was, I, malpractice is a strong word, but I kind of now look back, I'm like, wow. Um, you know, there was a lot I should have known. And I just had never been trained. It was not a part of my training. At Stanford, we are moving forward to um, have mental health training for all of our pediatric residents as a part of our uh, just normal pediatric programming. Uh, because res we need to graduate now with the capacity to do this. Um, and this is the organization uh, led by Peter Jensen. He is a very well-known child psychiatrist, founded this group to, to do this work, and has trained uh, primary care doctors all across the country um, in mental health training. Uh, so it's not just the three-day training. Then you have uh, every other week calls for six months to go over complex cases. So I'm still learning a lot. It's hard, but um, it really has changed my prescribing, my screening, everything. Um, it's been really great. So ACEs, ACEs are coming. Um, the, uh, this is the original article, which uh, came out of San Diego. Uh, uh, you all have a lot of, to be proud of with this work um, uh, with Dr. Felitti. Uh, so the original screener is there on the left. It's, it's a screener um, that asks about any uh, childhood uh, trauma that you had. So it talks about violence, watching violence for yourself, watching violence within your parents, any kind of sexual assault, neglect, food insecurity, if family members have been in jail. I mean, it's, it's tough stuff. Um, and what they found with this original study was that people who had higher ACE scores went on to have much worse health outcomes. So earlier age of uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, et cetera. So it, the whole life course is affected by this difficult childhood. And um, it has since been evolved. Um, and uh, what we're looking at uh, starting this January in California, if you screen uh, your families for adverse childhood experiences, you can get reimbursed for that. Um, and so the, the tr tr uh, screener that you have to use is called the PEARLS. Um, and so uh, there's a whole conversation about that. This is a separate lecture. Um, but that, the, the, the train has left the station. Okay, we're doing this in California. This is not, I think it's interesting. We can talk about it in the question and answer period. This has not come from the AAP. This has come from the state of California, which I think is interesting. Um, but it's something that you can opt in to do uh, to kind of open up and try to understand the background and, and the story of your, of your um, patient and uh, sometimes your patient's parents. And um, so again, what are you going to do with that information? You know, we really were trying to think about how to have more providers and, and how to address it. And what's interesting to me is of all of our clinics, we've really been thinking about ACEs a lot. And we're taking very different approaches. Um, and that's what we're actively working on right now. The East Palo Alto Clinic has decided to take a resiliency-based approach. So they are using the pearls, but they're starting. The first question they have on the screener is, what is your big, greatest hope for your child? So they want the parent to write down their, their greatest hope for their child. And then they, they, so they try to really kind of start with this aspirational thing. And then what do you do to take care of yourself as the parent? What's your self-care things look like? So to try to build into that, if you discover ACEs later on, if they don't want mental health, you can talk about their own self-care. So there's, it's a different approach. The, the top San Mateo County Clinic is going straight pearls. Just here's the screener. Let's see what your score is. Let's refer you if you need it. So people are taking a lot of different directions. I think this is a perfect natural experiment. Uh, I think there's incredible research questions to be asked here. Um, so I think it's a, it's a brand new day. Uh, and a lot of exciting opportunities. So in the, yesterday, I got to meet with a lot of people hearing about how you all are moving forward with ACEs. It's, it's an exciting time. So those are some local examples, I think, of how we can uh, come together to practice population pediatrics and kind of uh, take, take good care of our kids. So let's talk about what we do at the level of the state. Um, a few years ago, back in 2007, uh, with some of my colleagues in Northern California, uh, we reached out to the 17 training programs in California. So it's a huge state. I thought when I first started thinking about it, there was like five I could name, you know. No, there's 17. And um, so reached out to them and built the California uh, Training Collaborative uh, in Community Pediatrics and Advocacy. And uh, what's really exciting, look who's there, Nancy Graff. This is uh, Greg Blaschke, Dean Seidlinger. So it's a great, great group. and. Um, this was our very first meeting at PAS in Hawaii, if anybody was there, uh, back in 2008. Uh, so we came together to say, how could we share our curriculum around pediatric community training uh, and start doing advocacy together, start raising our voices together? Um, and so that's what our, our very first meeting looked like. Um, and we started taking our residents to Sacramento. 
Uh, we did this with the American Academy of Pediatrics on their advocacy days. And in the past, um, the AAP had had their advocacy days and um, some people would come, you know, 15, 20. We started bringing our residents and really having a very different presence. So we were able to coordinate it, come, learn about what the active child health bills were, and then uh, break up into our different groups and go and meet with our uh, elected officials to talk about it. So for a lot of our residents, this is brand new. They're like, what? You know, uh, very different. But once you've talked to them a couple times, a couple different offices, you realize really, as even as a resident, how much expertise you have and how much they have to learn from you. Um, so we've talked about a lot of different things, everything from immunizations to protecting WIC and the uh, supplemental nutrition program, SNAP. Um, so it's been really a great experience. And uh, we will, we're going again uh, this year in May. Uh, so I kind of wanted to show you what it looked like a little bit. Um, this is uh, a hearing around immunization. So if you've paid attention to the news at all, you know that California has really shifted in how it is uh, addressing immunizations. And uh, Richard Pan is uh, the main uh, driver of this. He's the author of all of our immunization bills. He's a pediatrician at, from UC Davis. Uh, and was originally an assemblyman and uh, then went on to become a, a senator. He's in uh, his uh, Senate term right now. Um, it is so just game changing to have a pediatrician uh, in our elected body in Sacramento. He brings up so many things that otherwise really would go un unaddressed. And um, just as an aside, I was able to um, spend part of my time in his office for two years in Sacramento with some of the health services work I do. I'm not talking about today, but um, kind of translating that as, as CCS was being reformed. And um, it's a great experience. He is very open to residents, other faculty who want to take a, a couple weeks or a month. If anybody's interested in interning up there, spending time, wanting to see what it looks like, he is uh, quite open to that. So. Um, uh, so anyway, this is a typical hearing room. Senators or assemblymen up on the, uh, assembly people up on the dais. Uh, he introduces the bill. The people that are opposed to the bill sit on one side. People who are in support sit on the other. And then people who are gonna come in and, and make testimony come in up on the, on the right here. So what the video is, uh, is Richard introducing the bill. And he says, you know, I'm here to introduce this bill and uh, there is a very strong anti-vaccine community there. Uh, they really had mobilized and said, if you pass this bill, which required families who wanted to get exemptions uh, to uh, have to get a form signed by a physician, and the family said, well, we won't be able to find a physician to sign this form. So that was their argument. And so it starts off with um, Richard uh, introducing the bill, and then uh, the person who's running the hearing says, okay, please come and introduce yourself and enter uh, your support or opposition. So the first person comes up and it's you know, somebody from the AMA and they're in support and somebody from Kaiser, he's in support. And uh, then it starts with the pediatricians. And Miles Abbott, if you remember Miles Abbott, was, says I'm you know, American Academy of Pediatrics, represent you know, pediatricians in California, we're in strong support of the bill and we will sign the form. And then the next person comes up and she says, you know, I am American Academy of Pediatrics and she was from UCLA, I will sign the form. Next one comes up, it's Nancy Graff from UCSD. I am Nancy Graff, I will sign the form. This went on for seven minutes. We had all of those residents, over 100 residents and faculty lined up, went outside the door, down the stairs, went all the way around. And they went up and introduced themselves from all the academic centers from across the state and every single one of them said, I will sign the form. And that was the video I was gonna show you of them just coming through, coming through, coming through. And it was over. I mean, you know, when we come together based on the evidence to advocate for our patients, you know, it is a strong statement. This is not a bill about me getting more money. It's not about scope of practice. This is about what we know based on the evidence works for our kids and, uh, and it passed through. So we've worked in close coordination with the American Academy of Pediatrics and with Richard to bring a more coherent voice. Advocacy, we have to do it together just like practicing population pediatrics. We can't do this in silos. We all have to be or get organized and start moving uh, things forward together. And it's been an incredibly effective um, example of, of what we can do. 
So this statewide collaborative, in addition to going to Sacramento, we shared curricular materials, um, kind of built up our training uh, for all of our, our residency programs. Together, we train 860 residents um, every year. And so when you think about those kind of numbers, it's, I think, a really powerful thing that in California, every pediatrician who comes through all of our programs is trained in social determinants and how to engage in community and basic advocacy skills. And the, a lot of these residents stay. And I think that will ch create kind of a sea change in California in terms of the pediatric voice. Many leave and take these kinds of uh, ideas and training uh, to the places that they go. So I'm very proud of that. Um, this model of building statewide collaboratives has, uh, uh, because it worked in California so well and is still working, we're still working together, has spread to other places through the Community Pediatrics Training Initiative. This is uh, an initiative at the national level of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and I and some of the other faculty have been coaches to other states, so I've coached up uh, the, the training programs in Missouri. These are the amazing pediatricians who fight very different advocacy battles in Missouri. Uh, they've taken stances on breastfeeding and other things. Again, we go for things that are evidence-based, evidence-based that we know work for kids, that that is our metric. Um, so they're great. And then uh, uh, did some coaching in North and South Carolina. Uh, two states, eight pediatric training programs, one team. And they are just doing remarkable work around food insecurity and early childhood literacy are the two topics that they have chosen to take on. And again, work across programs. Instead of competing with each other so often, we think of each other as competitors. Um, they've really moved into a space of um, working together uh, to advance things for kids in those states. Wonderful colleagues. And we have, uh, those are just a couple examples, but um, uh, statewide collaboratives in different stages of development across the country. Um, and the goal is by 2020, um, of the 198 training programs in the country, that we would have statewide collaboratives in 114. So really creating this, uh, not only sharing our curriculum around community pediatrics and disparities, but being able then to go to the capitals uh, when there are statewide issues going on, uh, and then when we need to, expanding that uh, to do um, collaborative work together across the country uh, when we have national level work that needs to be done. So that takes me to leveraging innovation and social media for national level advocacy. So back in the fall of 2007, um, I don't know how many of you remember uh, the S-CHIP battle. So the State Children's Health Insurance Program uh, was a uh, program that had been set up, uh, an extension of uh, Medicaid, uh, to cover kids uh, whose parents worked, so they made too much to have Medicaid, but they didn't work in jobs where private insurance kicked in. Okay, so prior to CHIP, the CHIP program, kids who lived in families making less than about $24,000 a year for a family of four would have Medi-Cal. But private insurance doesn't kick in until you make about sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, right? So this gap of people who worked weren't covered. In the Clinton administration, with a Republican Congress, they passed CHIP, the Child Health and State Child Health Insurance Program. It was S CHIP at the time. It covered that middle group. Okay, that was the, the last group of kids that were really uninsured. The program was set for ten years, and for ten years. It had been evaluated backward and forward. It had great evidence. It kept kids out of the ER. It, it, was, it was a great program. Everyone loved it. Nobody expected it to get not be reauthorized. And yet, then it suddenly got caught up in a very political thing that really didn't have anything to do with the merits or, or detractions of CHIP. And so we were, I mean, everybody, the pediatric community was so frustrated. And so um, I reached out to our government relations person, and I said, what could we do? And she said, eh. It's Northern California, there's not much we can do. We're, you know, our people get it uh, who represent us. And so we reached out to the collaborative, the California Collaborative, and said, what, what could we do together? And then to the AAP. And over the course of seven days, um, pulled together a Stand for Chip, Stand for Kids event, and it was 41 universities and children's hospitals in 22 states. And it was largely resident run. Resident driven, resident run, because residents were so frustrated. Like, wait a second. Half of my kids are going to lose their health insurance. What do you mean now I can't see them anymore except in between their well child checks? Like, you know, and so it, it really kind of put a, a spark to some anger. Um, and so uh, this is what it looked like. This is what it looked like at Stanford. Um, we had all gathered in this courtyard and um, the fire alarms went off. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't pull it. Um, but people came flooding out of the buildings and I was like, wow, okay, the cosmos. 
The Cosmos is good on this one. Uh, we had a parent speaker. This is me speaking. And then uh, I tried to put in the media coverage, because the key was to have media coverage. You can do this, but if you don't get it out in the media, for what, right? Um, and so this is some of the, I was actually on Fox News that morning. Um, so we had a rally. Uh, we did calls to our representatives on a letter writing campaign. This is what it looked like at UCSF and the general uh, up in San Francisco. They're always very funky. They always do homemade signs. Um, over in Oakland, Santa Clara, it's our county hospital in San Jose, and nationally. Uh, so we had lots of uh, great, it, it really did raise awareness. Um, this picture, it's a really pretty picture from the University of Miami, uh, ended up on the cover of Roll Call. If anybody's ever worked in Washington, that's the little newspaper that's printed. So we were on the cover of Roll Call, and we got a call from some colleagues we were working with in Washington, and they said, okay, everybody's heard of it now. You're on the cover of Roll Call, which we had no, that was just luck. Um, University of New Mexico, interesting story. They gathered in front of their children's hospital, and the hospital got very nervous. What are you doing with signs? What are you demonstrating about? No, you can't do this. They said, okay, and they walked across the street to a park. So you, you, there's tension about this. And, and I think to, for me, I've encountered that in many different times in different places, it means you're, you're poking at power. It means you're pushing something. And so I don't see that as a bad thing. It's a time to step back and think quickly and critically about everything and have you checked everything, but sometimes you know, that just means you're, you're actually in the real fight. Um, so this is what it looked like pre-social media. It was signs and traditional media. Going forward, uh, about a year and a half ago, very, we were caught very flat-footed uh, when the current administration said they wanted to make big changes in Medicaid. This is not a program that uh, we had seen as being in the crosshairs. And so um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, amazing leadership, uh, put together some programs, again, section on pediatric trainees. The residents are key in this. The next generation really gets it. Um, pulled together a social media storm. And they didn't know if this would work. This was an experiment. Um, but they pulled it together and said, let's try to raise awareness in our elected officials of the critical nature of Medicaid for our kids. So Medicaid is the foundation, the bedrock of coverage, not only for our um, all kids, for well children, but for the complex kids you all take care of. Now, I, this is something I always teach our residents. As a general pediatrician, I have a choice. Will I see publicly insured kids, privately insured kids? Will I take a mix? It's my choice as a general pediatrician. As a cardiologist, you will always take care of both. As a pediatric nephrologist, you will always take care of both. The epidemiology of child illness it's rare, right? And it hits the socioeconomic spectrum evenly for the most part. And so as a specialist, this is actually more critical for specialists, um, that, that access to Medicaid, if you do not have equal access to Medicaid, disparities are going to explode. Because access to your specialty services is critical in, in reducing disparities. So di changing that access is a huge threat. This is more important to the specialist. And my CEO gets this. We talk about this a lot is defending Medicaid is critical to the mission of my children's hospital. Um, so uh, AAP, again, I can't say enough good things about Mark Del Monte and the work that they've done. They said, let's see if this will work. We don't know if anybody will do this, but let's try. So we tried. And we used our, a lot of our statewide collaboratives to do this. So on June 22nd, we had this day of action social media storm and took to Twitter. So how many people here are on Twitter? OK, a handful. Um, it is the, the voice. It is the way we reach our elected officials, because every single elected official is on it, and all of their staffers are on it. Okay, And I'm going to circle to that in a minute. So these are tweets. You see pictures of tweets here. That's Flint, Michigan, over there on the left, uh, Seattle, Nationwide Children's. So you can see the different kinds of events people were having, taking pictures and tweeting about it. Um, here we are in California. I was very proud of the California Collaborative. Here you all are. Yay, UCSD. That's the picture you all posted and tweeted. So that's great. Um, but you can see great representation from California. Um, what they ended up doing was having it at noon on the East Coast and the noon uh, Central, the noon Mountain, and the noon Pacific. So that uh, first, because that's when all of us can get out and do something, right? Uh, but then also so that w our tweets were trending. Okay, so that there was a wave of them coming all, and we could sustain that for four hours, and that becomes critical. 
So here's other pictures that we were able to grab off the um, Twitter feed. This was happening all across the country. That's a beautiful shot from the general. They do such nice things in San Francisco. So you can see CHLA, uh, and then these are programs across the country. Some people did a noon talk. There's lots of different ways you can do this. Some people took a break before clinics started to call their elected officials. That's what it looked like at Stanford. So don't cap my care, hashtag don't cap my care was one um, hashtag that we used, and hashtags are the way you track conversations. Okay, and so how many kids did we, and keep kids covered was the other. So don't cap my care had about 5,800 posts, reached nearly 4 million individuals. Keep kids covered, 8,000 posts, almost 9 million individuals. Okay, so this experiment worked. Okay, we can bring a collective voice together if we need to. And really, for the first time, legislators understood there was a unique pediatric component to this. The, the advocacy for kids gets lost in the advocacy for adults. Prior to that, the Medicaid conversation had been all about adults. Nursing home coverage from Medicaid, dual eligibles, because that's where the money is. Okay? And so we really have to break through that and help them understand that if you change Medicaid policy, you could change things that catch kids up in it, and it could have a really devastating effect for our system that our system is distinct. Our epidemiology is distinct and needs to be thought of differently. And so the reason that we know that this, this worked, you could ask me, and I think it would be a fair question, who were those 9 million people? Do I care? Do I care that you reach them? And I learned this in Sacramento, and I've definitely seen it since then. Staffers who run these offices of the elected officials spend their entire day on screens, either the screen on their hand or the screen on their computer. And on the right, they have a bar of what's trending on Twitter. Okay, So the hashtags that have the most hits are literally bouncing around in real time. Okay, So you read it, keep kids covered, bouncing around. Don't cap my character, bouncing around. At any given moment, right now, Beyonce is trending. I'll just tell you right now. Okay, <laughs> There are some things that are just always trending. So it's, it's a mix of fun and politics. But um, So that day, because we did it at noon, 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 and noon, um, particularly keep kids covered was trending. So I'm a health staffer. I'm in Washington. I'm like, well, what is that? Click, click. So I click keep kids covered, and all those tweets I showed you just, just unspeakable unspool on their screen. So they, they go up, they see UCSD, they see you know, you know, CHOP, they see Texas, they see what they're like, oh, look at all these doctors, what are they talking about? Okay. So we know we got into every single office in Washington and every single elected official's offices in all 50 states that day to bring forward that pediatric voice. So this is a powerful new tool. Social media is a powerful new tool. And when we took this to the residents, they were like, I said, OK, well, so this is really exciting. We're going to do this today. We've been getting ready for a couple days. And I'm like, everybody get out your phones. We're going to get on Twitter. And they were like, we're not on Twitter. And I was like, what? And they're like, no, uh, because they're on a lot of different things. OK? They're on the ones down here, the fun ones. And um, these are just some basic statistics about the different platforms. Um, because they said, Twitter, I said, why is no one on Twitter? It's like, that's where the health policy conversation is. And one of them said, it's serious. It's like work. <laughs> and I went like this. I put my hands on the conference table. I go, we are at work. This is our work. This is not optional. This is a part of my job. It's a part of our jobs to do this. So all of mine are now on Twitter. <laughs> um, this is what mine looks like, and it's, it's a whole different, a different lecture, and I love giving it. Um, we're doing a lot of it uh, around how do you do this as a professional? This is a professional site. You don't see what I had for dinner last night on it. You don't know anything about my kids. I, uh, the, the, and I'm not actually a social media person. I'm not on anything else. Um, so this isn't something that comes naturally to me at all. But I recognize that this is where the health policy conversations are happening. And when you follow really smart people on Twitter, you learn a lot. Uh, so anyway, separate conversation, which I'm happy to have. I want to tell you the story of This Is Our Lane, uh, because I think this is another way that Twitter really amplified an, at an issue. Uh, this has to do with the National Rifle Association. So the NRA posted this, and it uh, says, someone should tell the self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane. Half of the articles in the Annals of Internal Medicine are pushing gun control. Most upsetting, however, the medical community seems to have consulted no one but themselves. And that's, they're talking about peer review, but we won't go into that. So they posted that on November 7th at 11.43, OK? So mocking kind of tweet. Joseph Sarkin, 
who's a trauma surgeon. So he says, as a trauma surgeon and a survivor of hashtag gun violence, I cannot believe the audacity of the NRA to make such a divisive statement. We take care of these patients every day. Where are you when I'm having to tell those families their loved one has died? And then he hashtags a couple different groups here that you could follow. So that is at 3 o'clock on the same day. So a couple hours later, again, real-time conversations, he fights back. And everyone starts posting. This is what it looks like to stay in my lane, NRA. I can't post a patient photo, so this is a selfie. Good morning. Just a reminder, at NRA, this is my lane. This is our lane. She didn't make it. First, uh, first patient, first day of residency. Gunshot wound to the head. Tried saving him as his mother cried into my shoulder, pleading for me to save him. He didn't make it. He won't be the last one. The blood continues to spill. This is the last. This last week, my colleagues and I, again, treated a number of gunshot victims across Philadelphia. Hashtag Philadelphia. The vast majority are under 25, African American, and male. The hashtags here are senseless, gun violence, enough. And this is our lane. Massive transfusion protocols, thoracotomy, intracardiac epinephrine, resuscitating difficult, but even harder was telling the family their loved one died of their gunshot wounds. Another day at work. What this led to uh, was a petition uh, that went forth, and over 41,000 physicians signed it, uh, basically a statement saying that gun violence is a public health emergency. We should approach it as a public health threat, move forward with building the evidence, and take evidence-based steps forward. And so what I think is interesting about this is that it started in the Twitter sphere, for sure. Um, it crossed over into regular mainstream media. So that's how we can use our social media to cross over into mainstream media and move the conversation forward. And what's unique, you can really see here, we are bearing witness to our perspective, our story. And our story in the past hasn't gotten out. Right? Not a lot of people see these pictures. And uh, so I think it's an interesting, interesting approach. Last thing I want to kind of talk about is kind of structural changes that um, are happening in, in some institutions to reflect this new uh, movement of advocacy. And so this is the, was the traditional structure at our program, education, research, and clinical care. And uh, we had a new chair come in a couple of years ago. And uh, she added policy and community. Um, and that's my role now. I'm the Associate Chair of Policy and Community. I don't really know what I'm doing exactly, but we're, we're trying to build some things. And my job and my goal is to create, across an entire department, all of our subspecialties, an advocacy voice, a coherent voice, and an educated faculty who understand what's happening around child policy and facilitate their engagement if they want to engage. So we're using social media uh, and uh, raising awareness and participating in different ways. So one of the things I've done is I've gone to some of our subspecialists. And I've said, what do, what's driving disparities in your field? How do you treat our Medi-Cal patients differently than our privately insured patients? And these are the things they say. We can't get home blood pressure monitoring for our Medicaid patients in nephrology. And it's critical, but we can for our private pay. Um, this one is the one that's hot right now that I'm working on in our genetics, uh, cobalamin C deficiency treatment. Uh, can't, they can't get it covered. Uh, that's a change we need to work with with CCS. So tapping into the drivers of disparities across different divisions, uh, it's, it's going to be unique. And so I'm still trying to figure out how do I support the different divisions uh, in trying to make regulatory change, policy change to address some of these things. I think this will help with burnout. It's just my instinct. <laughs> but if you're frustrated with these things and you have somewhere to go with it, um, I think that'll change some things. It's been fun going to the different divisions. I'll present at a division meeting, and you know, 12 of them, endocrinologists sitting there, they're looking at me. And like three of them, typically the junior faculty, like they spark. They're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, OK, you're my people. We're going to start working together. So I'm pulling together three here, four there, three here, four there. And I'm building this cadre of junior faculty who get this stuff and who want to lead their divisions and give them the skills uh, to take action together. So they need a path to promotion. If these junior faculty are going to do this work, they got to get promoted for it. So much like medical education, where there's a med ed portfolio, we uh, was part of a group that wrote an article about the advocacy portfolio. I won't go into those details, but we're trying to establish, and we've presented this to our A&P committee, and they have approved it, that we have a path to promotion for our junior faculty who do this work. 
Our residents drive a lot of this. This is our resident advocacy council. They're amazing. Uh, again, these are our big issues that we're fighting for. Uh, but this is what it kind of looks like. Um, they coordinate, they lead things. They're all fired up about the census right now, so we gotta do something about the census next Tuesday. They have a lot of morning reports and noon talks that we do, letter writing campaigns. Uh, we go to town halls. When our legislators are in town, we wear our white coats, we stand up, we thank them for being champions for children. Uh, we raise an issue about kids, make sure that they are, understand kids are in the conversation. We almost always get approached by the media afterward to talk about it, which they're trained to do. A couple of, whoever's like the strongest residents get an advocacy award, they get to go to Washington, D.C. with our government relations director, Sherry Sager there on the right, one of my main colleagues, is Zoe Lofgren, our representative. So just kind of in conclusion, I hope that I've conveyed that policy matters, uh, that we have a uh, unique new voice and that there are significant disparities, but I think it's a really exciting time uh, because we have new tools and new opportunities to speak up for kids. And as I learned about Dr. Hamburger and I was reading about him and about his uh, commitment to universal coverage and that one of the adjectives for him in, in addition to being a war hero and a uh, clinician and a scientist was activist. And I, I hope he would have enjoyed this lecture today. So thank you again for the honor.